Objection. The bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Today, we take another step to advance historic gun violence prevention legislation. H.R. 1808, the Assault Weapons Ban Act of 2021, restores and updates the prior assault weapons ban that kept weapons of war out of our communities for a decade before Republicans opposed its renewal. As we, as we have learned all too well in recent years, assault weapons, especially when combined with high capacity magazines, are the weapon of choice for mass shootings. These military style weapons are designed to kill the most people in the shortest amount of time. Quite simply, there is no place for them in our streets. In 1994, we banned these killing machines and countless lives were saved, but that ban was allowed to lapse 10 years later. And since then, we have seen the predictable results. Mass shootings have increased exponentially in our public spaces, schools, movie theaters, supermarkets, houses of worship, parades, you name it, have all become vulnerable to attack. An assault weapon's only purpose is to kill people efficiently. It is time to protect our communities and to ban them once more. The Assault Weapons Ban Act would prohibit the sale, manufacture, transfer, or possession of semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices. At the same time, it grandfathers existing semi-automatic assault, semi assault weapons and contains numerous protections for law enforcement and responsible gun owners, such as hunters, gun collectors, farmers, sports shooters, and those who use firearms for self-defense. We will undoubtedly hear a variety of arguments from our Republican friends opposed to taking these deadly weapons off our streets. But it is important to consider today's debate in the context of our other efforts to address the violence plaguing our communities. Time and again, Democrats have advanced responsible gun safety legislation only to face Republican opposition marching in lockstep with the extreme agenda of the gun industry. In this committee, we have advanced bipartisan legislation to conduct background checks for all gun sales. Our Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee opposed it. We advanced legislation to close the Charleston loophole, ensuring that law enforcement has sufficient time to conduct a background check. Our Republican colleagues on the committee opposed it. We advanced legislation to close the boyfriend loophole, which would keep guns away from domestic abusers. Our Republican colleagues opposed it. We advance legislation to keep guns away from those who are a danger to themselves or others through extreme risk protection orders. Our Republican colleagues opposed it. Following the mass shootings in Buffalo and Duvalde, I introduced the Protecting Our Kids Act, which would raise the age for purchasing se certain semi-automatic rifles to 21, prohibit straw purchasing, require safe storage, and ban large capacity magazines, bump stocks, and ghost guns. This legislation passed the House with bipartisan support, but most Republicans, including all our Republican colleagues on this committee, opposed it. We advanced the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which included some of these same provisions. Most of our Republican colleagues opposed it. We advanced legislation to provide more resources for law enforcement to solve murders, which reduces gun violence by putting murderers behind bars and reducing retaliatory shootings. Most of our Republican colleagues on the committee opposed it. Recognizing that, <coughs> recognizing that despite our best efforts, we cannot prevent all incidents of gun violence, we advanced legislation to give law enforcement a tool to better notify the public when there is an active shooter. This legislation, endorsed by numerous law enforcement organizations, received bipartisan support on the House floor. But most of our Republican colleagues on the committee, yet again, were opposed. That brings us to our markup today. Will our Republican colleagues choose to defend the weapons of choice for mass murderers and those who seek to target law enforcement? Will they choose to defend tools designed to kill as many people as possible in the most efficient way? Or will they choose to defend parents who dread a phone call that their child was the victim of carnage in their classroom? Will they choose to defend Americans who simply want to go shopping to march in a parade or go to a movie theater without the fear of having a target on their back? Will they choose to remove weapons of war from our streets? It's an easy choice for me. I want to thank Congressman Cicilline for his leadership in bringing this legislation forward. I urge all of my colleagues to join me in supporting this important legislation. 
and protecting Americans from gun violence. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think in your opening statement you used the term, uh, you used the phrase Republicans opposed it, I think, seven times, if I count it accurately. The reason we oppose it is because all those pieces of legislation were a direct violation of the Second Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Plain and simple. It doesn't say the right to keep and bear muskets shall not be infringed. It doesn't say shall not be infringed unless Democrats say this weapon looks so scary we have to get rid of it. It doesn't say that at all. It says shall not be infringed. We said this in the last, the last markup on legislation where the Democrats were trying to infringe on Americans, law-abiding American Second Amendment liberties. We said the Democrats' beef is with the Second Amendment. If you want to change the Second you want to get rid of the Second Amendment, go try a constitutional amendment. See how far you get with that. But instead, no, you come with these pieces of legislation. If this legislation becomes law, millions, millions of firearms that Americans legally own today will be illegal. Under this bill, if you give one of those legally owned firearms to a family member or a friend or a neighbor, you could end up in federal prison for five years if you don't go through an FFL for a background check prior to letting your grandson use your firearm. Think about that. Millions of guns that fit the description of those outlined in this bill are in the homes of law-abiding Americans as we speak right now. This bill would send these law lawful firearm owners to prison if they try to give a neighbor or sell them to a friend. Not only would this legislation strip Americans of their rights, but it would do nothing to make our community safer. We know that because Democrats tried it before. They tried it with the, quote, assault weapons ban in 1994. And guess what? That ban was found to be ineffective in reducing violent crime. A congressionally mandated study concluded that the banned guns were never used in more than a modest fraction of all gun uh, uh, violence, uh, gun murder, excuse me, before the 1994 ban, and that the law's 10-round limit on new magazines was not a factor in multiple victim or multiple wound crimes. The bill before us today repeats the same assault weapon ban and limits new magazines to 15 rounds. Democrats know this legislation will not reduce violent crime or reduce the likelihood of mass shootings, but they are obsessed with attacking law-abiding Americans' Second Amendment liberties. For over 30 years, the Democrats have been running a propaganda campaign to make people believe that, quote, assault weapons are a specific class of firearms that no one needs to own. In reality, assault weapons is a message-tested phrase made up by the political class to advance its anti-gun agenda. 1998, gun control advocates at the Violence Policy Center made up the term assault weapon to stoke fear and exploit public confusion about commonly owned rifles. These advocates stated that this confusion can only increase the chance of public support for restrictions on these weapons. Just last week, in a moment of candor, the Associated Press cautioned avoiding terms like assault weapon and assault rifle because they are highly politicized and convey little meaning about the actual functions of the weapon. Despite what gun control advocates claim, semi-automatic assault weapons are not designed to spray fire. They are not designed to be fired from the hip. They are not high-powered. They are not equipped with grenade launchers and rocket launchers, as some have said. The notion that adding certain accessories to an otherwise lawful rifle can somehow turn that rifle into an assault weapon is illogical and wrong. Proponents of gun control label standard capacity magazines sold with commonly owned firearms as, quote, high-capacity or large-capacity magazines. The overwhelming majority of magazines sold with rifles and handguns have the capacity to accommodate between 15 and 30 rounds of ammunition. Both semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices <clears throat> have been used for self-defense purposes. This legislation will not make our community safer. It will, in fact, make them more dangerous. In 2019, there were 386 self-defense killings that were determined to be, quote, justifiable homicides by investigators and prosecutors. In 2013, a study ordered by the CDC and carried out by the National Academy's Institute of Medicine and National Research Council found that annual defensive uses of a firearm range uh, numbered up to 3 million. This number has likely gone up since then as more states have passed laws allowing law-abiding citizens to carry a concealed firearm. And most importantly, the very types of firearms we are discussing here today have been used in numerous self-defense situations just this year. On July 7, 2022, a Florida homeowner fired his AK-47 style rifle when individuals forcibly entered his home. After the ho homeowner opened fire, the individuals immediately fled. When asked if the homeowner would face charges, Escambia County Sheriff Chip Simmons said, absolutely not. The homeowner's protecting himself and in Florida, 
And in Escambia County, you can protect yourself. On April 8th, 2022, a man in Melbourne, Florida, sitting at his truck, uh, uh, in his truck outside a friend's house was confronted by an angry acquaintance who opened fire on him. The man grabbed his own handgun and shot back. When the handgun jammed, the man retrieved his AR-15 from his backseat and started shooting back. The man maintained defensive fire until the assailant ran away. Police were able to arrest and charge the assailant. No one was injured. On April 7, 2022, in Brownsboro, Texas, a homeowner armed with an AR-15 rifle confronted a suspect who broke into his home by smashing through glass of the front door. The homeowner held the suspect at gunpoint until the police arrived. Democrats get their way. Law-abiding Americans would be prevented from using these weapons to defend themselves against violent intruders in their homes. Prevented from defending themselves, their family, their property because of this legislation. This legislation is dangerous. It doesn't square with the Constitution, with the Second Amendment in any way, and it has failed in the past. Because of all that, I urge my colleagues to vote against it. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without, a, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. And perhaps uh, sometime today, our Republican friends will explain to us why their interpretation of the Second Amendment wouldn't prohibit us from banning the private possession of tanks or jet bombers. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment to the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment two in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1808. That objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute makes technical and conforming amendments to the bill. It also modifies the number of rounds in the definitions of large capacity ammunition feeding device, semi-automatic rifle, and semi-automatic pistol to be, conset, I'm sorry, to be consistent with the threshold set by the Protecting Our Kids Act passed by the House a few weeks ago. I urge all members to support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment nature of a substitute? For what purpose does Mr. Cicilline seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized, and uh, before he uh, begins, uh, let me advise people that uh, he plans to use a video uh, which, with very disturbing scenes, and uh, people ought to be warned of that uh, before, if they don't want to watch the video before he begins. Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this markup. And I want to say a special welcome to the many advocates and survivors of gun violence who have joined us today. Four years ago, a gunman armed with an AR-15 style assault weapon massacred 17 kids and wounded 17 more at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. In three minutes and 45 seconds, he fired 150 bullets. When he fled, he left 180 rounds of ammunition unused. Here's what these numbers sound like. Hello, we're at Stoneman Douglas High School, and I think there's a shooter. Hello? You still there? Talk to me, please. Holy shit. Holy shit! Oh, holy shit. oh my god! That audio was one minute and 18 seconds long. The gunman terrorized the students in that school for three minutes and 45 seconds. These shootings have become so frequent they often barely make headlines. Thoughts and prayers are well and good. When they follow with an action time and time and time again, they are hollow. 
These thoughts and prayers ring empty in the ears of survivors, many watching from home or in this very room today, missing a loved one or remembering the nightmare they lived through. And all of these thoughts and prayers are too late for the dead. So today I'm imploring my colleagues to take action to get these weapons of war, weapons designed for the maximum destruction of human life off our streets. Let me be clear, we all respect the Second Amendment, but it's not without limits. Imagine how much we could get accomplished if we clung to the desire to protect our children and communities as tightly as some of my colleagues cling to their rifles. There are more guns than people in this country, more mass shootings than days in the year. This is a uniquely American problem, and assault weapons only magnify the epidemic. When an assault weapon is used during a mass shooting, six times as many people are shot. And these bullets don't just pierce, they explode inside the victim's body and decimate them. For God's sakes, parents in Uvalde had to identify their children via DNA sample because the bullets ripped their children apart. And we know something that will reduce this carnage because we saw the assault weapons in work from 1994 to 2004. Compared with the decade before its adoption, the federal assault ban was associated with a 25% drop in gun massacres and a 40% drop in fatalities. And as soon as the ban expired, fatalities and shootings skyrocketed again. In fact, researchers estimate that if we still had a federal assault weapons ban, we would see 70% fewer mass shooting deaths. If the ban had remained in effect, 70% of the families torn apart by these massacres would still have their loved ones today. Maybe if we hadn't let this law lapse, the parents at Parkland or Sandy Hook or Uvalde or in too many other places named wouldn't have to bury their children. For God's sakes, these weapons were designed for the military to use in war zones, for soldiers in jungles on them battlefields when taking on enemy fire. And we allow them to be purchased by anyone at any time, and we allow violent killers to use them in our malls and movie theaters and hospitals and schools to cause unspeakable destruction, places where we send our children. This is insanity. These are weapons of war. They don't just kill, they decimate. And every member of this committee takes an oath at the start of each Congress to support and defend the Constitution whose first words state our duty to ensure domestic tranquility and to promote the general welfare. Failing to act and allowing these weapons of war to proliferate in our communities, in my view, is a dereliction of that duty. So let's come together to get today to save lives and pass this bill and ban military-style assault weapons from communities all across this country. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Ohio seek recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Congress passed and President Clinton uh, signed in the law the so-called uh, Federal Assault Weapons Ban uh, the year before I was sworn into Congress and the year before I became a member of this distinguished committee. Of course, as a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, I most certainly would have voted against that measure had I been here, but I wasn't here yet. Ten years later, the ban expired. Over the past 26 years, I've had the honor of serving on this uh, important committee, which is tasked with, among other things, protecting constitutional freedoms uh, and civil liberties. What's abundantly clear to me is that this gun ban and other efforts over the years by uh, Democrats to restrict Second Amendment rights, like requiring background checks for transfers of firearms between individuals or creating firearms registries or dictating to individuals how they store guns in the privacy of their own homes not only infringe on hardworking Americans' rights guaranteed under the Second Amendment, but also fail to improve public safety. If given the opportunity, I'm sure many, if not most of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, would go so far as to completely repeal the Second Amendment in the same way that they've attempted to defund and dismantle the police. Even though many of them deny that, many of them were for exactly that same thing. And in this very committee, we've shown uh, snippets of tapes and speeches they've given saying exactly that, that they wanted to defund the police. It's not all of them, but it's a large number of them. And if they got their wish uh, to repeal the Second Amendment, there's no doubt that it would result in absolute and utter chaos in communities that we all represent all across the country. People wouldn't be able to defend themselves uh, in their own homes or anywhere else. 
The reality is that ownership of semi-automatic firearms is protected by the U.S. Constitution, and such weapons are clearly effective for self-defense. Instead of attacking law-abiding American Second Amendment rights and pushing legislation that wouldn't reduce violent crime uh, or the likelihood of mass shootings, we should be focused on keeping guns out of the hands of those with, for example, mental illnesses or people who have histories of violence and criminal behavior. That's what we ought to be doing. That would actually work. The real questions that we should ask ourselves before we act, Mr. Chairman, is this proposal constitutionally permissible? This is the committee that is supposed to determine that, at least with respect to Congress, before it gets through the courts. That's what we're supposed to look at. Is it constitutional? This clearly if is not. If the gentleman will yield, I'm happy to answer that question. I, I'm not yielding right now. Okay. Uh, and will it actually help to make people safer? That's the other thing, and I don't think it would. The answer to both of those questions, as I said, I believe is no. A few weeks ago, we did pass legislation that I supported, by the way, that will help to secure our schools. We ought to be looking to find ways to harden other soft targets, like places of worship and other public spaces, like shopping malls and movie theaters and those kind of places. We did it for schools. We ought to do it for those things as well not further eroding the constitutional rights of hardworking, law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. There are some cutting-edge uh, gun safety things that we could do. Uh, for example, we could assist cities and communities with funding uh, to invest in gun fire detection and location technology, as they do in Avondale, a neighborhood in my congressional district. This Cincinnati neighborhood and the surrounding areas have experienced a significant, nearly 50% decrease in illegal gun use. That's an example of something that actually works. We should get that across the country in communities that want them. Um, it's this sort of technology that's having a measurable effect on reducing shootings and gun violence, uh, not legislation that has already been found to be ineffective because, as we know, uh, during the 10 years the so-called assault weapons ban was in effect, 1994 to 2004, there was no appreciable reduction in gun deaths despite that. People are always arguing the, the statistics. That's what it basically indicated, that it didn't do any good. And uh, if we did it now, I don't think it would do any good at this point either and would probably be struck down by the United States Supreme Court. So let's do something together in a bipartisan manner that would actually work, as we did just uh, recently. Uh, but I think this is an effort that isn't going to go anywhere. It's not going to get through the Senate. It's not going to become law. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back for purposes of the gentlelady from uh, Texas seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, just to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I am glad that you, as I've watched you over the years, respond to the crisis and needs of the American people. Not the politics of what will get in, what will pass in the Senate, who believes in it, but to the American people. Let me offer my deepest sympathy. Without any action, it means nothing, but my love and concern to those who are here in this room who've experienced the vial of gun deaths and their loved ones who will never come back, or they themselves were victims. H.R. 1808, the assault weapons ban of 2022 would prohibit the sale, manufacture, transfer, or possession of semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices. Let me thank Mr. Cicilline for his leadership. After the Pulse nightclub, I introduced H.R. 5470, Stopping Mass Killings by Violent Terrorist Act, to ban assault weapons. And the same repetitive words, let's get the guns out of children's hands, let's do Nothing was repeated in 2016. Since that time, we have seen the vileness of violence and death. Whether we call them assault weapons or AR-15 style weapons, we all know that we're talking about civilian versions of firearms created for the military. That what was used in Buffalo. The people in Buffalo are still crying and they're asking for relief. I met their family members. And after Buffalo, 
my heart is still aching. Because how can you ignore these babies in Uvalde? I'm not going to ignore them. Not only are we doing this in their name, but it is important for us to go to Uvalde for there to be a congressional and federal presence on getting the truth. Day after day, mass shooting after mass shooting, we're confronted with the carnage that is inflicted on the human body when these weapons of war are used against elementary age children, teachers, parade goers, high school students, worshipers, shoppers, and on and on. In America, gun violence is the leading cause of death among children while mass shootings occur increasingly every year. I cannot think of a state represented on this dais that has not been forever changed by at least one mass shooting. In the state of Texas, we've done nothing. It is no secret that I'm adamantly opposed to assault weapons and large capacity magazines and implements that are designed for war. I'm not against the Second Amendment. And I will take issue with any babble about this undermines the Second Amendment. It does not. It is to create a militia. Maybe the one aspect in the Second Amendment that my friends never talk about is to recognize that there are Supreme Court cases that said that we could regulate Neither of these kinds of guns belong in the community. In 2019, the Judiciary Committee held a hearing on assault weapons. We heard testimony from a trauma surgeon who described the devastating wounds and injuries suffered by victims of mass shooting at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. Tragically, I was there too. The shooter wielded an AK-47 style weapon. We all know that the parents in Uvalde were asked, I just can't say it, but to identify their children through a method of science. DNA. There is no debating that when paired with large capacity magazines, assault weapons perform as they are designed, killing more people quickly. You can't stop them. There were eons, tens upon tens of guys with good guns, uh, good guys with guns in Uvalde, and they did nothing, absolutely nothing with their guns. Nothing. Because they too must have thought this was a weapon of war. Because of their concealability, portability, lethality, assault weapons are often the firearm choice for perpetrators who commit startling public acts of mass murder. On July 4th, they are often the weapons used when law enforcement officers are targeted because due to their ability to overwhelm the typical gun sidearm, like the ghost gun assault weapon used in Third Ward, Texas, in my district, shooting three officers in coal, in, in, out in the open. H.R. 1808 will help gradually reduce the number of assault weapons and large capacity magazines available, keeping them out of the hands of criminals and out of the hands of people who are there to do deadly deeds and to kill our children. I am tired of seeing parents bury their children. And therefore, this enables the states to do what they need to do. The bill contains many protections for responsible gun owners, hunters. It ensures owners of those grandfather weapons uh, to store them securely and do not allow people prohibited from possessing. So they're grandfathered in. There are many weapons that are not included. It exempts antique and most manually operated firearms. In 1994 to 2000, it includes exemptions for specific uses such as law enforcement. We are reasonable people, and this is a reasonable effort. And I look forward to pursuing the debate and saying enough is enough. We love our children. I demand relief. And I'm not worried about the other body. They need to do what is right on behalf of this country. In God, we trust. And I believe we're going to pass the assault weapons ban, and the president will sign it into law. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Gen Gentlelady yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. This, this bill is unserious and unconstitutional. But let me, we'll get into the unconstitutionality of it later during the debate as we offer amendments. But let me talk about the unseriousness of it. And some of what I'm about to show you may come as a surprise to the other side of the aisle. And you may want to go back and, and redraft it again, I don't know. But the 1994 to 2004 so-called assault weapons ban banned firearms by cosmetics and by name, much the same as this bill does, cosmetics and by name, without regard for the actual lethality of the firearm. And what happened between 94 and 2004 is the manufacturers within a year or two 
just changed the, the names and the designs of the firearms so that by 1996, they were making them all again. And then by 2004, there were at least twice as many of these types of firearms in circulation as there were before the ban. So I don't know how you make the argument that, this, that the 94 to 2004 ban reduced crime because, because it reduced the number of assault weapons, so-called, because it didn't reduce Gentlemen the number. Gentlemen, yield for a second? Um, uh, Just for a second. I will, I will here in a little bit. I need, I've got some other points I need to make. So the other side of the aisle says, this bill will ban weapons of war. Really, will it? Let's look at the exempted list. You guys might want to get out the bill and check this. It exempts the M1 Garand. I'm going to read you. So you can still, after this bill passes, you can own an actual weapon of war. What they're calling weapons of war are not weapons of war. They're, they're sporting rifles, but what they're not banning are the actual weapons of war. The M1 Garand is not banned by this bill. And in a letter to General Campbell from General Patton, General Patton says, in my opinion, the M1 rifle is the greatest battle implement ever devised. Guess what? Not banned in this bill. The actual weapon of war. What else is it banned in this bill? The quintessential Chinese army weapon of war. The SKS is not banned by your bill. Very charitable to allow people to own this piece of Cold War history. Uh, here's the Chinese army practicing drills with one of the weapons they're most, proudest of, most proud of, which is the SKS, not banned in this bill. An actual weapon of war. The bill does ban sporting firearms, though. What do we have here? Well, the gun they're primarily going after in this bill is the AR-type firearm, which stands for Armalite, not assault rifle. It shoots this cartridge, 223. It was designed so that it was lighter weight. And it, frankly, it's not even suitable. I mean, some people use it to deer hunt, but it's not the preferred caliber for deer hunting. This is the, the uh, cartridge that is used by the M1 Grand, which is not banned by this bill. It's many times, many times more powerful. Let's, let's talk about another weapon of war. What do we have here? This is Iwo Jima. This is the, the M1 carbine. Also not banned by this bill. A technical, literal weapon of war. Yes, they're over there whispering to themselves, oh my gosh, why didn't we ban that? Why didn't we think to ban that? Because you're not banning weapons of war. You're banning the most commonly sold sporting rifle in the United States right now. You're not banning weapons of war. If you were, if you were serious about it, you would ban the quintessential Chinese weapon of war. You would ban the rifle that Patton, General Patton, described as the, as the finest battle implement ever devised. You would ban it, but you're not. And you would ban the, the M1 carbine that was used to take Iwo Jima, but you're not. You're not banning weapons of war. You're banning firearms that law-abiding People who are just exercising their Second Amendment rights go out and, and buy and purchase every day and use to defend their families. Would the gentleman now yield? And, and with that, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? I'll, I'll yield to the chairman, and I would love it if Thank he could you. tell I, us why he didn't ban weapons of war in a bill that's supposed uh, to I just want to. I just want to point out that whatever the uh, weaknesses of the 90, 1994 bill, um, gun deaths went down by 25% promptly, and when the bill was allowed to lapse, they went right back up. It's, and, and if I may respond to that, Mr. Chairman, uh, if they went down, which they probably did because crime overall went down during that period, it wasn't because the number of assault rifles went down. They actually went up from 94 to 2004. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Georgia seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. And the ladies recognized. There's a reason that we never see the images after a mass shooting. 
There's a reason that the screams of little boys and little girls in Uvalde were edited out of the video that everyone in this room has surely seen. I've spoken to doctors throughout the years who have spent time in emergency rooms. Our handguns, they tell me, often create small and very subtle wounds, wounds that can even be difficult to find. Assault weapons are a completely different story. When the call comes into the hospital, doctors are told to prepare for a mass casualty, casualty event. Nurses are asked to find every gurney and wheelchair that they can find. The medical staff call every surgeon that they can contact. The dead and the dying arrive in waves. Doctors assign the wounded a color. Green means flesh wound. These patients will survive without treatment. Yellow means a bullet in the chest, and they could die within the hour. Red means these children or churchgoers or parents or patrons have only minutes to live. The trauma surgeons see them first. Black means that there's no longer a reason to spend effort or resources on the corpse coming through the doors. Floors in these hospitals begin to look more like a battlefield. Doctors turned army medics doing everything they can to stop the bleeding and to remove bullets and body parts that will keep patients alive. The doctors must deal ceaselessly with the pain and panic of the frightened victims many of them terrified at the blood on their clothes, praying to their God that they will not die. Assault rifles cause something called cavitation. The bullet does not just travel through the body, it creates a cavity within it. Organs ruptured and shred. Bones shatter and the shards serve as shrapnel as soft body tissue is torn into pieces. With assault rifles, exit wounds can be a foot wide. The victim is Oftentimes, when they're shot in the head, their skulls explode. Arms and legs disintegrate and turn to dust. And the damage from these weapons of war is far greater in our children. Their organs and arteries are smaller, and they have only half as much blood as adults. In Uvalde, two children were decapitated by bullets. Bodies of others were pulverized beyond recognition, the damage caused by these weapons more closely resembling a grenade than a handgun. We are paying for these weapons of war on our streets with the blood of our children sitting in our classrooms, our churches, and our communities. Mothers and fathers waiting in line for DNA tests, forced to learn secondhand whether body parts littering the schools is all that's left of their child. And what's the purpose of this carnage? I know my colleagues on the other side of the Mr. aisle. Chairman, agree Mr. Chairman, that this the right up, to Mr. Chairman, this markup is not in order. Right. Mr. Chairman, but where then the gentlelady deserves to be heard. The markup is not in order. The gentleman is correct. The gentlelady will proceed. Sir, may I reclaim some of my time? Yes. Thank you. We're paying for these weapons of war on our streets with the blood of our children sitting in our schools. Mothers and fathers waiting in line for DNA tests, forced to learn secondhand whether body parts littering the school is all that's left of their child. And what is the purpose of this carnage? I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would agree that the right to a weapon is not an unlimited right. But where then do we draw the line? Are we free to acquire C4 plastic explosives to defend ourselves? Can you infringe on my right to a tank to protect myself? Does your neighbor have the right to patrol the neighborhood with a Predator missile for safety? Should we all have access to our own nukes for protection from enemies both foreign and domestic? Of course, this would be absurd. If civilians would access these weapons of war, there would be more devastating carnage and chaos. Are the gentleman yield? With us, I will not. With assault rifles, this madness already exists. Assault weapons are not made to protect. They are made to murder and maim. They are designed to destroy. And now, instead of the American military using these firearms to cut through our opposing forces, these weapons are being used to cut down our children. There's a reason that we never see these bodies after a mass murder. It's because many of them no longer exist. There is a reason these weapons of war do not belong in our schools, in our grocery stores, and in our churches, and in our communities. It's because America should not be at war with itself. And I yield back. 
Gentleman, the gentlelady yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Texas seek recognition. I strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, James Madison wrote in Federalist 46, besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any form can admit of. Notwithstanding the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear, the governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. And it is not certain that with this aid alone, they would not be able to shake off their yokes. But were the people to possess the additional advantages of local governments chosen by themselves, who could collect the national will and direct the national force, and of officers appointed out of the militia by these governments, the local governments, and attached both to them and to the militia, it may be affirmed with the greatest assurance that the throne of every tyranny in Europe would be speedily overturned in spite of the legions which surround it. Noah Webster wrote in an examination of the leading principles of the federal constitution, quote, before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed as they are in almost every country in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops. Patrick Henry wrote in 1778, guard with jealous attention the public liberty Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whenever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. Now, people look at those words in 1778 differently than some today in 2022. They look at them differently because they're not looking at through the prism of having come out of a tyranny with King George and exercising their liberty to extract themselves from that tyranny and establish a new nation. But the principles remain the same in any event. The principles are exactly the same. And that is the reality of the purpose of the Second Amendment. And some like to point to a part of the Second Amendment and suggest that some of us ignore that part. No, we just analyze the clause and analyze the entirety of the Second Amendment and recognize that well-regulated in the 18th century meant well-organized, well-armed, well-disciplined. And it was the whole of the people, the people of the day that made up the militia because they just organized and they organize themselves against tyranny, and they organize themselves in order to stand up against the king. Will the gentleman yield? And I will in a moment, uh, to the chairman. Um, that is the reality of the, the, the origination of the Second Amendment. Now, we have weapons for a variety of purposes. We talk about it here regularly, hunting, defending ourselves. I'm gonna talk in a minute, a minute when we talk about amendments, about the need for the people of Texas, for example, not only to hunt, not only to hunt deer, pigs, all the various things that we hunt in Texas, uh, but also to defend ourselves with a wide open border, with cartels that are well armed and empowered along our border, with incursions that are reaching into communities in South Texas. And again, I'll address that a little later in an amendment. But we have the right to do that and to defend ourselves. And the history is replete with examples of the extent to which Americans have defended themselves and in fact using the weapons that the majority wants to take away, whether it was uh, a citizen using an AR-15 chase and shot down the Sutherland Springs shooter, whether in Harris County, Texas, a 15-year-old with an AR-15 defended himself and his 12-year-old sister from two home invaders in Houston, Texas, a Texan with an AR-15 took down three drive-by shooters. 
A man with an AR-15 defended himself and three others from a gang of seven masked and armed criminals. A good neighbor with an AR-15 stopped a stabbing without firing a shot. Three Hawaiians with an AR-15 chased away three attackers. I could go on and on. Would, did you that is our right, you? fundamentally. It, uh, I, I now am out of time, which I did not mean to run the clock out. Would you, would you yield? Uh, I just wanted to say the gentleman is quite correct. Um, the founding fathers feared standing armies. And that's why they had the Second Amendment. That's why they, as, as you read from the Federalist Papers, they feared a founding army. Uh, I'm sorry, they feared a standing army and a well, and a well regulated militia, which meant every able bodied man um, had to have a musket in order to be available for call up when necessary because they didn't want a standing army. That hardly applies today. Um, I, I yield back, and um, who said, who said, for what purposes generally from Washington, see? Yes, I will yield in response. Yes. I just said that. Oh, sorry. I don't have a mic's on. The general, the general, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Washington seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. General is recognized. Mr. Chairman, my colleague across the aisle just said, we have the right to defend ourselves. What about our right to live? What about the right of every single person here to have the family member that they lost in a mass shooting? What about that right? It is stunning to me that so many of my Democratic colleagues are able to cite at least one mass shooting that killed a constituent, a friend, a loved one, where an assault weapons ban could have prevented a tragedy. It is also stunning to me that that is probably true for my Republican colleagues as well. They just choose not to speak about those similar stories of their constituents who have lost loved ones. They choose not to speak for the majority of Americans who support an assault weapons ban. This is not a crazy idea that only Democrats support. This is a ban that the majority of Americans support, even in a Fox News poll. Look at these courageous people who are sitting here, who have chosen to take the trauma that you all have experienced and use it to try to stop trauma for other people to try to stop losses, listening to that video and the sounds, and I saw your faces, and I know that this trauma has not even lessened or gone away, and I am so grateful to you for being here to speak up on this. At 2 p.m. on June 1st, 2022, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a shooter brought an AR-15, a gun that would be banned under this bill. Less than three hours later from the time that he bought that AR-15, the shooter used that weapon of war to murder four people, including Dr. Preston Phillips, the father of one of my staffers here on the Judiciary Committee, a man who was a gracious and loving husband, father, and brother who dedicated his life to his family and his medical practice. I and all those that I represent benefited from his love and his warmth, both during his time practicing medicine in Seattle and through his brilliant daughter and my staffer, our family member here on the Judiciary Committee, Elise Phillips. My heart goes out to all of the families of the four people that were killed in the community in Tulsa that still grieves. This is not an isolated incident. The people that are in this room are proof of that and they are populated in districts across this country. And in the aftermath of these shootings, in the aftermath of the children who have to be identified by DNA in Uvalde, in the aftermath of, of, floor, of Parkland, of every single mass shooting event that has happened, we feel rage. We feel rage because we're not prioritizing the lives of people, our right to live. The rage that I feel that just three hours, in just three hours, a person can buy an assault weapon and commit a mass shooting while conservative Republicans look the other way. Today, I dare my Republican colleagues to stop looking away. Stop ignoring the tragedy 
that is faced by people across this country. Stop ignoring the tragedy of your own constituents who have lost loved ones and family members in shootings with assault weapons. Stop ignoring the shooting in Clackamas, Oregon in 2012 that killed two people with an AR-15, the shooting with an assault weapon in Dayton in 2019 that killed nine people and injured 17, the shooting in Marathon County, Wisconsin in 2017 with an assault weapon that killed four people. These are all in Republican colleagues' districts. It is our duty to stop these killings. And the assault weapons ban will prevent mass shootings like the ones that our districts, our friends, our families have faced by prohibiting the possession, the manufacture, the transfer, or the sale of assault weapons. And it is shameful to resist or even hesitate to take action to stop the use of these weapons of war in mass shootings of civilians. So for every person who says, I have a right to defend, I say to you, we have a right to live. And your right to defend with a weapon of war does not obliterate our, lot, our right to live. That is the core of why we must pass this bill. And I thank my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, for all of his work on this. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back for what purposes, Mr. Stubbe seek recognition. Uh, move to strike the last word, Mr. Chair. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would uh, yield to a member on the Democratic side that served in a combat area designated zone uh, and deployment of our country. Anybody in the Democratic side? Mr. Stubbe, what's the purpose of the question? My father. My father. I, no, 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 let me finish. No, let me no, finish. Because because I, I'm going to make a point, and you're taking my time. So I will yield I am to any member who Because deployed. I'm offended to at your suggestion that somehow, if we've not served in a combat zone, that we don't care about protecting the lives of our constituents. Has nothing That's to do with That's why I'm responding. For our family members who have lost this blood, is time. they should be responding. Reclaiming my time. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like 40 seconds I've seen back on my the clock. constituents die in battle. It's Mr. Stubbe's time. The gentleman is recognized. And I will ask for 40 additional seconds that I was taken. Okay, so I, I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom. I served in the Army, and there's a lot of talk in Washington about weapons of war. And my purpose uh, of yielding to one of my colleagues who may have served uh, was to ask them a specific question of what type of firearm were you issued when you were deployed? And the answer to that question is a true what would be defined as a weapon actually used in war has a selector switch on it for fully automatic, three round burst, and semi automatic. So, when I deployed in 2006 in Operation Iraqi Freedom, we were issued M4s in the United States Army. Those M4s had a selector switch on them. Those selector switch allow you to have fully automatic, three round burst, or semi automatic. Those firearms are not allowed for purchase in the United States today. So, these, this, this, cascading of weapons of war, what I was issued, and again, I would ask any person that served in a deployed environment, you are issued weapons that allow for fully automatic and three-round bursts. That is not available for purchase in the United States, and that is not what the Democrats are attempting to ban today because that's already banned. What we're talking about is a semi-automatic rifle that only is used in a semi-automatic form. So behind me is a typical AR platform weapon and you can't see it because it's on the, this side, not the other side, that has a selector switch on it. That selector switch is only for fire or not fire, safe or not safe, and that is for a semi-matic operation of the weapon, which means every time I depress the trigger, I depress the trigger, a round comes out of the firearm. All right, next slide, and just move it over. This is a, the most popular handgun in the United States that was purchased is a Glock 19. It functions in exactly the same way as this rifle. It's a semi-automatic, just like that's a semi-automatic. The rifle's not available for purchase, don't have a selector switch for three round bursts or fully auto. This is a semi-automatic handgun. As quick as I depress the trigger of this Glock 19, a round comes out of the chamber. The functionality between that weapon and this weapon are exactly identical. There is no difference. So you're, you're banning a class of weapons that you don't like the look of, not because of functionality, not because of how fast a round comes out of the weapon, just because you don't like the way that they look, because they function exactly the same. Now move this one over one. 
So now this is a Glock 19. The Glock 19 comes with a 15 round magazine, which under this bill is legal, although it's interesting that a couple weeks ago you banned 10 round magazines and then you changed it to a 15 round magazine. It's interesting to understand the thought process there, but that is for another time. This is a six hour P320, which some of you probably saw in one of the hearings on the magazine bans, I showed my P320. This comes with a 20 round magazine. So under this bill, because it has a 15 round magazine ban, this gun would be banned because you wouldn't be able to use it. Again, it functions exactly the same as that gun. It functions exactly the same. As fast as you depress the trigger is as fast as a round comes out. So now the next, next one. So that, that gun would be banned. That would be okay because you can put a 15 round magazine in it. This is a lever action. Under this bill, lever actions apparently are okay. Um, but semi-automatic AR platform rifles are not okay, so we're gonna discriminate against the type of firearms that we're going to use, despite the fact that the functionality is the same. The only difference here is after you depress the trigger and a round comes out, you have to reload using the lever action, which saves you maybe half of a second. The next one, which is also legal, is a tubular. This is a, a tubular 22, which again, and, and Mr. Massey did a good job of highlighting how ridiculous the calibers of the, the bullets are. We are, this, the, the Democratic majority is discriminating against some of the most popular weapons in the United States simply because they don't like the way they look, not because of the way they function. And there are so many Americans that are confused when they see the semi-automatic rifle that the Democrats want to ban as being fully automatic. It's not, you can't purchase that, it's illegal. It is not a weapon of war. A weapon of war has a fully automatic switch or a three round burst. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would thank you and, and the bill sponsor, Mr. Cicilline, for all his steadfast leadership on getting a assault weapons ban back on the books. For me, the choice between banning warfare weapons and protecting children is a simple no-brainer. Para mí, escoger entre proteger nuestros niños o proteger armas de guerra no es una esencia. In 1992, the father of a second grader went on a shooting spree at the Piney Point Elementary School in Southwest Houston, 1992, wounding two officers and prompting teachers and students to flee the campus. I still vividly remember this incident because the shooter was brought before me when I was a judge to read him his Miranda rights and begin his process through the judicial system. So it pains me deeply that our children are still at risk and not safe in schools, and that our communities must still tolerate living in fear of suddenly losing their lives or their lives of their loved ones. As others have referenced, we've had an assault weapon ban, and we must renew it. We must do it again. Congress has turned a blind eye too long now to the leading cause of death of children in America. Mr. Chairman, I move to introduce into the record the following, following an interim investigative report by the Texas House of Representatives Investigative Committee on the Rob Elementary shooting in Evaldi. Without objection. The shooter, while he was still 17, asked at least two people to purchase a gun for him. They both refused. Instead, he focused on buying accessories online, including a gun sight, rifle sling, and a body armor carrier. As soon as he turned 18, the legal age to buy guns in Texas, on May 18th, he then went and spent $3,000 on two AR-15 style rifles from an online retailer, which shipped the weapons to Valde. The, this in a report that I referenced made a finding of fact that there was no legal impediment to the attacker buying two AR-15 style rifles, 60 magazines, and over 2,000 rounds of ammunition when he turned 18, when he turned 18. So with this legislation, it passed this type of warfare like weapons that took the lives of 19 children would not have fallen in the hands of this 18 year old with clear red flags, or at least not as easily. The interim report states that a total of 376 state and federal law enforcement officials were on the school grounds almost 400, almost 400 good guys with guns who could not stop 
one bad guy with a gun. Why? Probably because they faced a shooter with a military great uh, weapon and didn't want to get into the crossfire. There's still a lot of investigation as to what really happened with the lack of command and control in the part of the police officers. But what is important here is that the shooter was able to very quickly, easily buy two AR-15 style weapons. Law enforcement officers are not soldiers. We're past half measures. I'm proud to vote in favor of this legislation. And to be clear, schools are for books. They're not for bullets. And to be even more clear, I'm not supporting this bill because I don't like the way any weapon looks. I'm for this bill because the weapons that are being banned are meant to kill people, plain and simple. You know, I grew up on a farm, Mr. Chairman, I've told you that before. I know how to shoot a rifle, I know how to shoot a shotgun, I still own a shotgun. I'm a native Texan, that is part of the way we do things in Texas, I'm afraid. But I use that for protecting myself in my home. I haven't been hunting in a long time, but my brothers use theirs for hunting. It's not meant to kill people the way these automatic style weapons do. With that, Mr. Chairman, I say again, it's time that we reinstate this ban. It's time to support this bill. I thank Mr. Cicilline and I thank you. And with that, I yield back. The general lady uh, uh, yields back. For what purposes does Dean seek recognition? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The uh, general lady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first want to acknowledge the Uvalde and Parkland families and the other victims of gun violence who are in this room. I cannot really imagine what it must feel like to sit where you sit, to sit straight and steel yourself against some of the extraordinarily horrid arguments you are hearing on the other side of the aisle. It's telling to me <clears throat> that you heard the ranking member and now every member on the other side of the aisle never acknowledge you or your losses, our losses, because do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Your losses, your children's losses, your family members' losses are our own. That's why we are here today on this side of the aisle. You know, I'm hearing a lot about the Second Amendment, but let me quote some other important founding truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We must lift up the right to life. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle print for you part of the Second Amendment. They leave out the dependent clauses that are, that are in the front of it intentionally to mislead. The right to the people of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but for a well-regulated militia. The opening clauses are about a well-regulated militia. So the shell is not absolute. The shell is not everything. It's about a well-regulated militia, as the chair has argued. Regulation is not infringement. Today we are here talking about what is a uniquely American problem, the horror of gun violence in this country. And it is a uniquely man-made problem. And in that, there is hope. Because if it is our problem, and it's made by man with too many guns, guns such as the ones we are trying to ban here today, there is hope. And I would say that in those two clauses that I just read to you, we have the power, we have the obligation, we have a sworn duty to protect life, to protect life, to save lives today. I'm a mother to three sons and a grandmother to four. I take so much joy in being a grandmother Aubrey was born in 2011, Ella and Sawyer born in 2019, and last but not least, Scotty, my youngest little one, was born last year on Juneteenth. It breaks my heart to think how different Aubrey, 10, and her Sawyer, Scotty's lives are. Although gun violence was terrible 
10 years ago, but it's only gotten worse. In Scotty's world, the world of a one-year-old, guns kill more kids than cars do. In Scotty's world, there were 692 mass shootings last year, a new record. In Scotty's world, she will be learning her active shooter drills at the same time she's learning how to tie her shoes. That is the life of Aubrey, Ella, Sawyer, Scotty, and all of our children. And the children of Uvalde, the children of Parkland. This is insanity. What we have the obligation to do, what the adults in the room have the obligation to do is to acknowledge the humanity, acknowledge your losses. I challenge the folks on the other side, show your own humanity, solve problems, instead of just simply standing behind the last clause in the Second Amendment. Personally, I'm here fighting for Aubrey, Ella, Sawyer, Scotty, and all of our children. I thank the gentlewoman from Georgia for bringing up what is so often not talked about, the grievous wounds of these weapons that today we are seeking to ban. The grievous, unspeakable wounds. A doctor at uh, Highland Park said they were unspeakable, but I think we must speak of them. It is not right that a parent drops a child off for school in the morning and comes back to stand in a hell line in the afternoon seeking to identify that child. It's simply not right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General lady yields back for our purposes. This is the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition. Strike the last word. The is recognized. Mr. Chairman, my concern is the pattern, my, the, 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 the sustained attack on liberty we've seen from the left over the last couple of years. I mean, parents who want to speak up at school board meetings, nope, can't do that. Justice Department's going to treat you as a domestic terrorist, direct violation of their First Amendment liberties. How do we know this? Because we've had FBI whistleblowers come to Republicans on this committee and tell us over two dozen cases where moms and dads have been investigated. Department of Homeland Security stood up a disinformation governance board. Holy cow, talk about Orwelling, talk about a restriction on your First Amendment free speech rights. During COVID, during COVID, government told us you can't go to church, can't go to work, can't go to school. And of course, while all us regular folks were following the mandates, the elite, the people making the mandates, they could go to the hair salon, they could go to the five-star restaurants, they could visit with their family while we weren't allowed to. Maybe the best was what happened in, uh, I, I remember in Pennsylvania, the government there required you to wear a mask in your own home. In Vermont, the government didn't said you didn't have to wear a mask in your own home because you weren't allowed to have people over for goodness sake. So the restrictions on liberty are unbelievable. Just a few weeks ago, it wasn't the First Amendment, it was the Fourth Amendment. This committee passed legislation, the red flag law, passed legislation that said if someone doesn't like you, they can report you to a judge, to law enforcement. There's a hearing within 24 hours that you can't be at. Your lawyer can't be present. You haven't been charged with a crime, but they can take away your property. And then you have to go petition that court to get that property back, to get your rights back. That bill passed this committee, passed the full house. And now today it's a second amendment. First amendment, Fourth Amendment, today the Second Amendment. That's my con that's our concern. And again, the Second Amendment is clear. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's clear. So that's our concern, particularly when, as my colleagues have pointed out, some of the arms you're saying people can't have function exactly like some of the arms, uh, the arms that you say we can have, that law-abiding citizens can't have. Makes no sense. But the bigger concern in my mind is the sustained pattern of attack on fundamental freedoms. First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Second Amendment, that's what concerns us. That's why we'll be offering a number of amendments, trying to at least clear up some of this. But in the end, this legislation is bad and I hope it does not pass. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move the strike. The gentleman is recognized. 
I thank God that we are finally marking up this assault weapons bill, and I thank David Cicilline for his leadership. Seriously, how many more people have to die before my Republican colleagues wake up? How many more mass shootings must there be? Mass shootings are a uniquely American problem, and we have the tools at our disposal to stop them. Every damn year, this committee sits here and debates what Congress is going to do to stop the massacres. And we do it while listing off the litany of new mass shootings that have occurred that year. Sacramento, Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa, Highland Park. All of these shootings had one thing in common. They involved the use of an assault weapon, a machine designed not for protection or for sport, but for slaughter. All of these shootings involved an AR-15. Assault weapons have also been used as tools of hate. They were used to target the LGBTQ plus community at Pulse Nightclub in Orlando, the Jewish community at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and the black community at Top Supermarket in Buffalo, in my home state of New York. While Democrats are trying to pass gun safety reforms broadly supported by the American people, from universal background checks to today's assault weapons ban, Republicans have tried to block gun safety measures at every single turn. Yes, they offer meaningless thoughts and prayers, but their main proposal for addressing mass shootings is more guns. This solution is not only deranged, it has been debunked. In Parkland, Florida, as bullets ricocheted and bodies fell in the classrooms of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the armed school resource officer on the scene ran to safety outside the building. 17 innocent people died, and that officer is now facing trial for negligence and child neglect. All the good that it did to have him there in that moment. In Uvalde, Texas, where 19 children and two teachers were murdered at Robb Elementary School, 376 law enforcement officers reported to the scene. For those who are counting, that's 376 good guys with guns versus one gunman. Yet for over an hour, law enforcement did absolutely nothing and 21 innocent people were slaughtered. The Republican argument that school shootings would be prevented by simply introducing more armed officers into schools is a fallacy. And we just watched it play out. It turns out these assault weapons are so lethal, they scare the hell out of other people who have guns. My Republican colleagues also argue for arming teachers. Teachers, even when doing so, would put a gun in every child's classroom. By doing this, Republicans would place a weapon within reach of every single emotionally disturbed student who wishes to do harm to others. In the words of my generation, that ain't it. So what does work? The 1994 assault weapons ban worked. According to a recent study, the risk of a person in the U.S. dying in a mass shooting was 70% lower from 1994 to 2004 while this ban was in place. Deaths related to assault weapons in high-capacity magazines also dropped during that decade. Afterwards, those deaths shot back up, along with the number of mass shootings involving an assault weapon. This is not rocket science. Congress is not powerless to prevent mass shootings. We have a proven tool. I am so proud, so proud to support the assault weapons ban of 2022. There is no sound policy reason for opposing this legislation. That is why three in five Americans support its passage. Yet my Republican colleagues have a long list of sad excuses today for why they can't vote for it. Do not believe them. We all know the reason they oppose it. It's because the NRA Victory Fund spent tens of millions of dollars in 2020 to assist the reelection of pro-gun Republicans nationwide. It will never cease to amaze me how a political party that self-describes as pro-life still knowingly allows the American people to be slaughtered by weapons of war. How in the hell is Wayne LaPierre's blood money worth that price? The last time I called for the Senate to abolish the filibuster to pass an assault weapons ban, right-wing media went berserk, and Tucker Carlson attacked me on his stupid show. So obviously, I'm going to do it again.
or the people. I yield. Gentleman yields back for our purposes. The gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition. Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santiana. Um, here we are again. Here we are again. And uh, um, this failed 10 year experiment, 1994 to 2004, it failed. And uh, by the way, a little revisionist history going on here in regards to New York City. Uh, New York City's crime rate went down because of broken windows policing, because they were tough on crime. It is in the, in the law enforcement pantheon, it should go in the Hall of Fame because it got crime under control in America or in New York City. So what do we see? We're seeing deflection today. They don't want to address the issue of defunding the police and having prosecutors prosecute. I've got a bill out there, prosecutors need to prosecute. And we're not getting a hearing on that bill. The other side here refuses to address the issue that's at hand. You can't defund the police that's going on in Democrat-run cities all across America and not have prosecutors prosecute and keep crime under control. It's just not going to happen. We have a prosecutor in Wisconsin, Milwaukee County. He let a person off on low cash bail. He killed six people at the Waukesha uh, Christmas Parade just last year. Injured 60 people. He got out on low cash bail. Do you know what that prosecutor said over a decade ago when he came in to be a prosecutor? Yes, I'm gonna change how we go about prosecuting in uh, Milwaukee County. And yes, some people will die as a result. We're whistling past the graveyard here with getting crime under control. With that, I'm going to yield to the gentleman from Florida. Thank you for yielding. There was a lot of talk in the last um, gun control bill that the Democrats passed um, through this committee about there's not license permit carrier holders or those that are carrying in defense of others that act or they haven't heard of those instances. We just had one in Indiana where a guy at a mall uh, saved the lives of countless people. I'm just in the, the remaining time that was yielded to me, just going through just in Florida since 2019, instances of those license permit carrier holders defending others with firearms. In February 2019, the North Fort Myers, my district, Florida patron at a pizza restaurant shot a suspect attempting to rob the restaurants and its patrons. In April 2019, in Tallahassee, Florida, an armed robber was shot by a man he was attempting to rob. In April of 2019, in Largo, Florida, concealed carry holder shot a man who threatened his life, and then the Good Samaritan used his belt to treat the attacker's wounds until medical personnel arrived. April 2019, in Bradenton, Florida, my hometown, a homeowner fired on two armed invaders, scaring them off. June 2019, in Sun City, Florida, a man suspected of committing multiple carjackings was fatally shot by an armed business manager with a concealed carry permit while the man was attempting to break into the manager's store. June 2019, in my district again in Northport, Florida, a woman's boyfriend came to her defense when a man with a loaded handgun attempted to rob her while she withdrew money from an ATM. In July 2019, a disabled 61-year-old in Summerfield, Florida, heroically used his AR-15 to defend himself from four armed men who broke into his house. July 2019, Tampa, Florida, a pastor and a deacon defended a church from an intruder with a firearm. September 2019, Miami-Dade County, a woman intervened with her handgun to stop the brutal beating of a man outside of a fast food restaurant. It was the first time she had fired her gun outside of a range. October 2019, Tampa, Florida, a woman who was eight months pregnant defended her family from violent home intruders, including her 11-year-old daughter who was threatened by the intruders, and she did it with an AR-15. January 2020, Cape Coral, Florida, a man with a gun defended three women from a man who was following them and threatening them. February 2020, Palm Bay, Florida, a man used his firearm to defend himself and his girlfriend from the woman's armed ex-boyfriend who attacked them in their home on Valentine's Day. March 2020 in Deltona, Florida, a mother of three shot at home intruded breaking into her home. March 2020 in Leesburg, Florida, a concealed carry permit holder used his firearm to stop a man who was violently assaulting other customers. And I yield back to the gentleman from Wisconsin. I have a whole nother list. Yeah, thank you for giving us that list. And uh, 
Uh, I don't know if you all saw the interview by Howard Schultz, um, originator of Starbucks, who is no conservative, who said it is no longer safe to be in many big cities across America because crime is out of control. Until this committee gets serious about refunding police, supporting police, and having prosecutors prosecute, the crime wave will continue in America. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and uh, I just welcome the people in Mr. Stubbe's district, if they feel unsafe there, to move to mine. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? We'll strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized. It's quite interesting what we heard from Mr. Stubbe and others. They first accused the Democrats wrongly about being for defunding the police, and then they give all the reasons why we don't need the police because everybody in their district has got a gun and is saving somebody every other day. So who needs police when you got Stubbe's constituents? Uh, ordered liberty is what we've got in our country, not complete liberty. It's not simply shall not be infringed. Scalia wrote in Heller that you had a right to defend your home, but other restrictions can and would probably be placed on use of guns, on unusual type of weapons and situations. Now, I know that was only Justice Scalia, and it was so long ago that it doesn't count as precedent, because precedent doesn't matter anymore. Precedent doesn't matter. It's what this new court thinks. And we've heard about what was going on in 1786 when the Second Amendment was drafted and, and all of the needs there. You can't go back to 1786 for everything because that's when slavery was okay and women voting was insane. And those things didn't happen. So you can't go back to that situation. That's just crazy. The fact is, Mr. Chip Roy really put out what this is about. It's not about the kind of weapon and this weapon and that weapon and whatever. It's about the fact that many of the people on that side and their constituents sincerely think they need to have a gun to protect themselves against the government, that they need a gun in their house, an AR-15, just like in 1780s, to protect themselves from a government and a military. They are ready for civil war. And yes, when the Civil War came, and part of the Constitution is about the Electoral College and the peaceful transfer of power, were the Republicans there? They were with Trump plotting the coup to take over the government, not with weapons, but with their abilities to try to stymie the government from giving Pence only the rights that he should have and letting the Senate and the House do what the Electoral College said it should do and just count the votes of the states. But that's what this is about. It's not about a SIG or a, or a Ruger or a, this AR or an AK whatever. It's about being able to protect yourself in your home from the government in some type of civil war that they foresee and that when it almost came, they were on the wrong side. They were on the wrong side of the civil war and still are avoiding so complying with lawful subpoenas to come and give information so the American public will know what went on and we can plan not to have such a situation in 2024 again. But they don't want to comply. That's paramount to all this other stuff is people having a right to vote and the Constitution working lawfully to have a lawful change of power. And they're not for it because they're afraid they have to have their guns to protect themselves from a revolution, a civil war. You know, we've had some amendment talk about the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, and the Fourth Amendment. How about the Eighth Amendment? Cruel and unusual punishment. This is my 16th year on the Judiciary Committee, and I've been listening to that stuff 16 years. I need a little Eighth Amendment relief. I yield back. The gentleman is, uh, the gentleman yields back for, purpose, for what purpose does Mr. Owens seek recognition? I'd like to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I'd like to yield my time to Ms. Stubbe. Thank you. Thank you, the gentleman, for yielding. And there's a reason why all the New Yorkers are moving to Florida at a vastly uh, egregious rate. But I'm just going to continue giving these examples. Uh, March 2020 in Deltona, Florida, a mother of three shot a home intruder breaking into her home. 
March 2020 in Leesburg, Florida, a concealed carry permit holder used his firearm to stop a man who was violently assaulting other customers at a convenience store. May 2020, Pensacola, Florida. Would the gentleman yield to, for a question? No. In May 2020 in Pensacola, Florida, a concealed carry permit holder drew his gun when a group threatened his life while trying to get in his car leaving the beach. May 2020 in Panama City, Florida, an elderly homeowner shot a home intruder who broke into his home and attempted to assault the homeowner's wife. October 2020, Miami, Florida, a woman used her handgun to drive off an intruder who broke into her home, holding her, her friends, and her family, including her seven-year-old son, at gunpoint. In December 2020, in Bluntstown, Florida, a man used his AR-15 to defend himself against two armed masked men who attempted to rob him. February 2021, in Molino, Florida, an armed homeowner stopped and detained two armed intruders attempting to break into his house while his wife called the police. November 2021, Newport Ritchie, Florida, a man shot and killed an attacker who stabbed him with a machete. December 2021, in Lakeland, Florida, a homeowner shot a violent intruder who had a history of 14 felony convictions. February 2022 in Steenahatchee, Florida, a homeowner shot an armed fugitive who broke into his home, ending a 10-hour manhunt. Would the and gentleman yield? No, I'm trying to go through my list. And well, I it's have not my time. It's, mis it's Mr. Owen's time. In February of 2022 in Steenahatchee, Florida, a homeowner shot an armed fugitive who broke into his home, ending a 10-hour manhunt. In May of 2022 in Azalea Park, Florida, a 69-year-old woman shot a man who threatened her on her own property. All of these are just in Florida and just since 2019. I'm sure that I could read for the duration of this entire committee that's gonna go all day and all night, a list of instances like this where law-abiding citizens used their rights under the Second Amendment to defend themselves against violence against themselves and their family and by banning firearms, especially firearms that are used in the defense of life, liberty, and property, Firearms that millions of Americans own and use every single day uh, is absolutely not the direction that we should be going in this country. We should be allowing for law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. And I just listed off a whole host of incidences where this happens every single day all across this country. I yield back to the gentleman. Mr. Owens, would you yield for just 30 seconds? Uh, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I just wanted to enter for the record this uh, article that just came out on July 19th, 2022, after Indiana Mall shooting, one hero but no lasting solution, and point out this simple statistic. An examination of 433 active shooter attacks in the United States between 2000 and 2021 showed that only 22 ended with a bystander shooting an attacker. In 10 of those cases, the armed bystander was a security guard or an off-duty law enforcement officer. In all other encounters, civilians attempting to step in and stop an assailant were themselves shot to death by police. I thank you so much for yielding, Mr. Owens. Absolutely, and let me just make this point. <clears throat> this is a little common sense. Uh, we noticed that where Americans are hurt the most, where crime is the highest, in those same states and cities where their ability to protect themselves is the highest. So it is common sense that if anybody steps into a domain, a home, we should have a way of protecting ourselves. We need to trust the American people with the rights that have been given from the very beginning. That's our Second Amendment. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know how, how we can justify taking the policies that's not working any place in our country in blue states, blue cities, and decide to mandate that for the rest of our country. So with that, I yield back. Uh, before I recognize the next speaker, I simply want to inform Mr. Stubbe that we're not going to go all day and all night. If we're still in session at 12 o'clock, midnight, I will move the previous question and end debate. Uh, for what purpose does Mr. Deutsch seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. And was recognized. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I also would like to just start with a few statistics, a few events. Um, 27 lives were taken at Sandy Hook Elementary School. 58 uh, lives were taken in Las Vegas at a concert. 49 in Orlando in a club. 21 less than two months ago in Uvalde. All of them, all of them, every single one of those lives taken from this planet uh, with the kind of weapon that we will be voting uh, to ban today. And in Parkland, as a lot of you know, I carry around since the day after the 
shooting a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, a piece of paper with the names and ages, forever, forever those ages, uh, of those who were killed. I thought it appropriate today to tack it up here for everyone to see right next to the gun. Again, an assault rifle like the one we will be voting to ban today that was used to kill my constituents. I never served in the military, but I think it's fair to say that every one of us here understands the difference between an automatic weapon and a semi-automatic weapon. The Parkland shooter fired 139 shots, killing 17 people and wounding 17 others in six minutes. I will not be lectured to by anyone telling me that somehow, because that's not an automatic weapon, we shouldn't be worried about it. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing to suggest. I want to I wanna ask... And by the way, as we're gathered here, let's also remember, right now, back home in my district, the case, the penalty phase of the, the case of the Parkland shooter is ongoing. And there's horrific video being seen. And it's tearing the families and the community apart again, as every mass shooting does, to every family who has endured loss. It's a chilling reminder of how easily and callously a shooter can take the lives of others quickly and without remorse. I'm going to ask, Mr. Chairman, if those of us, th those who have come here today, if they're comfortable, um, if they've lost a loved one, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a good friend, um, in a mass shooting uh, with an assault rifle, if they could just raise their hand. <laughs> We're having a conversation in which I want to be clear. Some of my colleagues believe it's more important to have these weapons to go deer hunting than it is to ban them to prevent future killings so that no other family has to endure what you've endured. I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry that we're doing this only now when it should have been done years ago. But I'm so grateful that you're here. And I want to finish with this. And Congresswoman Dean did this, referred to this before. We've heard about well, let, me, let me just also quote the Declaration of Independence, because I think Thomas Jefferson is also pretty important. And we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For every one of those lives taken, those rights are forever infringed, taken, stricken, yanked away from them forever. All this talk today, James Madison, Iwo Jima, the weapons of the Chinese Communist Party, Noah Webster, Patrick Henry, George Santayana, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Second Amendment, really important things for us to know about and study. And no one whose life was taken at the hands of a killer with an assault weapon will ever be able to study any of them, ever. My colleagues... There are a lot of people on this panel who like to debate on both sides. And I'm going to acknowledge on our side and on the Republican side, some of them are really good at it. But there is a growing number in our country, a staggering number in our country, of people who will never be able to participate in a debate and for the people taken, for the kids taken at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in my district, the kids that I knew, the, their friends that I've gotten to know, it is a tremendous loss for this body that they'll never have that opportunity and it's a tremendous loss from the, for this country and we've got to pass this bill today. I thank Mr. Cicilline for introducing it and I urge my colleagues to vote for it. I yield back. Gentleman yields back for what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Move strike, last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate um, the, de the debate and discussion we're having today. Um, I, I don't want to 
and don't have a list of, like Representative Stubbe does from, from his district, but I do have a number of times that well, good guys with guns have actually saved lives. And so uh, I wanted to bring one up, but I'll bring up several, but one in Arizona on June 26, 2022, where a homeowner um, shoots two individuals who are invading his house, coming in, invading his house. Um, he shot them. They were, they were given treatment and then succumbed. Uh, in Missouri, the guy's going in, he's going to get gas. Pays for his gas, go, goes back out to his car, but as he's going out to his car, he sees someone going into the store. And that person did, acted suspiciously. And then pulled a knife. Pulled a knife, stuck it to the throat of the female clerk. And... Uh, threatened to kill her, and this guy was able to go in. He was immediately distracted. The, the uh, fellow shot him and saved the life of that clerk. Um, he'd already been in and attacked another clerk in another gas station earlier that day. Uh, Mr. Stubbe alluded to the 22-year-old man who averted a mass uh, shooting in, at the Greenwood Park Mall in Indiana. Went in, immediately acted, and was able to save many lives. Um, and th that's just a, few of the just a few of the incidents and the reason that people do need to be able to have guns. They do save others' lives and they save their own lives. Well, both the CDC and the FBI report on firearms-related uh, deaths annually. And in 2020, the CDC reported 45,000 firearm-related deaths in the U.S., which was up from 39,000, almost 40,000 in 2019. Most of those, over half of them, are, are suicides. Um, when you get to homicides, though, uh, what, you, what this committee is not considering today is that there are more, more homicides committed by knives or other cutting instruments than with rifles of any kind. What you're calling assault rifles or anything. Uh, more murders are committed by knives or some, some implement to cut people. In 2019, there were 1,476 homicides by knife. There were 364 homicides by rifle. Blunt objects, actually, clubs, hammers, etc., accounted for more homicides than, than uh, rifles. Personal weapons, hands, fists, feet, accounted for 600 homicides versus the 300 and uh, 60 some odd homicides by rifle. So it seems to me that I, I understand your concern. I understand your argument. I think it's interesting, but until you're willing to face data and facts, I get it. But I want to point out something. Uh, when you start talking about lives that have been taken away, it is a tragedy, and it's more than a tragedy because most of the time these folks who commit these kind of crimes, it, to me it is, it is absolutely more than a tragedy because a tragedy impose, it, it implies some kind of, of chance, and this is not the case. Some, it, some of this is deliberate. But I hope that you feel grief for the 53 people in the back of that semi-tractor trailer in San Antonio, Texas, who were smuggled by humans, and the human smuggling and the death toll that comes every day across our border. And I hope that you'll join me in wanting to do something about that. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Stubbe, you yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to yield, uh, strike the last word and yield Gen my time to Representative Cicilline. Gentlelady is recognized. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. I just want to respond to a couple of arguments that my colleagues have made in their opening statements. The first is, you know, we had some lecture about some historic firearms and some relics. Those firearms are old and clunky and difficult to use and are not the subject of mass shootings. Uh, so there are exemptions in the bill for historic firearms. That's not the purpose of the assault weapons ban. The assault weapons ban also doesn't ban all semi-automatic weapons. In fact, it's very specific. And these aren't characteristics that were just pulled out of the air. President Bush, in the first Bush administration, directed a study at ATF to determine whether firearms that had been classified as assault weapons had a sporting or hunting purpose. And they did a thorough analysis. And they concluded that these semi-automatic rifles were designed and intended to be particularly suitable for combat rather than sporting applications. And they identified characteristics, military characteristics, that had no sporting or hunting value, but that had strategic military value. Those characteristics are listed in the report. They're the characteristics in the assault weapons ban because those characteristics make this firearm especially lethal because it steadies the firearm, it allows you to discharge or conceal it, so it's more dangerous and more capable of killing people quickly and efficiently. That's why they were picked. So the, 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 the fact that it doesn't ban all semi-automatic weapons, it's not intended to. It's intended to ban military-style semi-automatic weapons that have these characteristics that are set forth in the statute. So rather than, you know, doing lectures about Chinese guns and, you know, historical figures, read the bill. That's number one. Number two, the notion that we can't do this because we have a Second Amendment, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle know that is not true. And they know it's not true. The Supreme Court of the United States said it in Heller that the Second Amendment is not absolute. And they go on to say, like most rights, this is from Heller, the United States Supreme Court, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. From Blackstone, see, I can quote historic figures too. Through the 19th century cases, commentators and courts routinely explain that the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever or for whatever purpose. We think that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. After Heller, four courts of appeals all say again, the Second Amendment is not unlimited. And in fact, in the Fourth Circuit, just as an example, continuing in Heller, weapons that are most useful in military service, M16 rifles and the like, may be banned without infringement on the Second Amendment right. Now, by the way, these cases are not only available to me, they're available to our Republicans. They know this is the law. There is no constitutional right to carry an assault weapon. It just doesn't exist. The Supreme Court is not. So don't, don't you? No, I will not. And well. so, in fact, there is no constitutional prohibition. We have a constitutional obligation to protect people. And then finally, you know, many of my colleagues have listed a whole bunch of examples, and apparently we're going to get more. I, I'm sad to say I have an equally long list of people who have died at the hands of assault rifles in this country. I'm not going to list all that. As, but when you heard Mr. Stubbe, with I think one exception, those involved handguns. The assault weapon ban does not ban handguns. I'm sad to say people are having to use guns to defend themselves. That's another question. But he didn't give you one example of someone saying, I used an assault rifle to defend myself. I wouldn't have been able to do it with another gun. I needed an assault rifle. No such case. And all those cases, he's going to list maybe hundreds more, they involve guns that are not banned by this. So let's try for the, for the, the decency of the discussion and out of respect to the families we are to focus on what this bill does. This bill doesn't take away anyone's gun. This bill doesn't ban any handguns. It doesn't even ban all semiotic. It bans handguns that the Bush administration, the ATF, said are characteristics that make them especially dangerous and that they have no sporting or hunting purpose. That isn't my analysis. This is ATF. They listed these characteristics, and they know that. And so let's 
focus on whether or not you are prepared to support an assault weapons ban which saved countless lives and it was in effect. Mass shootings declined substantially and so did deaths because these dangerous military weapons that were created to fight on the battlefields and slaughter enemies don't belong in the neighborhoods and schools and movie theaters where we live. I yield back. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Does the gentlelady yield back? The gentlelady yields back. What purpose yes, is it? Yes, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1808 offered by Mr. Roy of Texas. Page 18, line That 12. objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank the chairman. Um, as we've discussed here, we're talking about banning a class of weapons for the American people to be able to use. We have differences of opinion about the merits of that, but I think uh, there's at least agreement in the chamber that the American people ought to be able to defend themselves. Some disagreement about what weapons you may have to do so. Uh, we certainly believe that <coughs> the American people should avail themselves of uh, the weapons they need to defend themselves across the country, but I thought that at a minimum, we should be preserving the right of people to defend themselves when they've been put specifically in danger as a result of the failure of the government to do its duty to secure the blessings of liberty as defined in the Constitution and to secure the communities for the people of the United States. And in particular, since we're sitting here in Washington and the United States Congress, recognizing the failure of the federal government to secure the border of the United States, leaving Texas and the rest of the nation under a constant barrage and assault from dangerous, well-armed cartels moving dangerous narcotics into the United States, moving dangerous criminals into the United States, moving dangerous uh, terrorists and terrorist affiliates into the United States, and that there is a real consequence of that along the border. So this amendment would simply say that we should exempt from this ban those individuals who live within 10 miles of the uh, international border uh, who is not otherwise prohibited from owning a firearm. As we know, we've had 1.746 million encounters this fiscal year. In October 2021, it was reported that the Texas Department of Public Safety's uh, Lieutenant Chris Olivares said Mexican drug cartels were murdering people and dumping their bodies on the United States side of the border, including a woman who had been raped, mutilated, and tortured before her death. These types of killings are often carried out as a message to rival cartels. Lieutenant Chris Olivar said, and they are noticing these killings happening more and more on the United States side of the border. Uh, border Patrol agents fired upon from Mexico. Uh, a recent uh, story articulating this is happening in, in La Jolla, Texas. In uh, 2020, in Hebronville, incident 80 miles into the United States with a heavily armed gunman. 2022, McMullen County Sheriff of South, South San Antonio saves 17-year-old girl taken from Nebraska being transported to be sold in Nuevo Laredo for $10,000. Last week, a million pills of fentanyl seized in California. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, I believe, the gentleman from Arizona, and correct me if I'm wrong, 500,000 pills uh, laced with fentanyl caught one million pills in, in Arizona, uh, uh, caught with respect to fentanyl-laced pills. Back-to-back um, -back record seizures from the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, 5,000 pounds of meth seized in California. Um, I could go on and on with examples of El Paso Border Patrol agents um, having 20 shots fired across the Rio Grande from Mexico. Uh, and this shooting took place three weeks after a narco banner in Juarez threatened to kill Mexican police and U.S. Border Patrol agents if they didn't stop messing with poleros, or human smugglers. Bullets, bullets can also cross the river in the border wall, the banner found hanging on a pedestrian bridge stated in Spanish. Fact of the matter is you have a danger that is palpable for the American people as a result of wide open borders. Uh, the people of South Texas are particularly uh, aware of this. In a recent gathering in Brackettville, Texas, I met with local county sheriffs, local county attorneys, local county judges. Uh, last year in Laredo and Webb County with the leadership of Webb County, I went down with Senator Ted Cruz. Two weeks ago in Eagle Pass, meeting with leadership there, meeting with Border Patrol. 
uh, and in Brackettville, a meeting with those local law enforcement who declared an invasion in South Texas with respect to the dangers that are being fraught upon the people of South Texas, the barriers being put in front of public schools in order to stop the uh, uh, abandonment of cars or cars that are, that are uh, hitting uh, buildings and endangering people, uh, the fences that are getting cut, the livestock that are getting out. There's a constant danger. Uh, and uh, you talk to people in South Texas that are talking about their children being armed on ranches in order to defend themselves, or there is a constant flow of traffic, many times being those with criminal records, criminal backgrounds, murders, robbers, rapists, rapists uh, both convicted in the United States and convicted in other countries, and that we should recognize the reality of a well-armed cartel infiltrating farther into the border of the United States and impacting South Texas, and that the ability of people to defend themselves would be stronger if they were exempted from this particular restriction on the freedoms of the American people to defend themselves generally. I obviously oppose the underlying bill, but figure that at a minimum, we should protect those people who are suffering at the hands of those who have uh, made our border unsecure. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? I withdraw my point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order is withdrawn. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment assumes that the United States military, that our armed forces are not capable of defending the borders of the United States in, against invasion uh, from Mexico or Canada, or I suppose uh, Ray our naval forces uh, from, from, the board, from, from our uh, uh, sea borders. It is, and instead, we must deputize civilians with unpermitted weapons, with weapons unpermitted by this bill to do the job because the military is incapable of it. This is absurd. Not, will, not worthy of further comment, and I oppose the amendment. Mr. Are Chairman. Back? I move to strike the last word. Does what per, for what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. It is an invasion on our southern border, and I wish there was any force in our government that cared enough to stop it. It's not an unsolvable problem. We could solve it, but we choose not to. And if we're choosing to turn our southern border states into America's dangerous turnstile, the least we could do is not disarm the people who are then forced to deal with that catastrophic influx of violence. A return to normal. That was the principal covenant between Democrats and voters when they obtained unified control of the government. A return to normal. But now, they've been in power for nearly two years and we have a country that is poorer, dirtier, and less safe. And there's no dispute about that. And now, having done that to our country, they want to disarm law-abiding Americans under false pretense, under the pretense that this is going to stop school shootings or that this is going to limit gun violence. I think we've seen a number of circumstances where people lawfully, responsibly exercising their rights the gun ownership have indeed make, made circumstances far better. I was very critical of initial moves right after the Uvalde shooting that Democrats made to have like snap gun control. I thought, well, maybe we ought to take a moment, see what these facts expose. And yet they were moving gun control legislation to the floor before we even know what we know now. That th This was not uh, a, a series of deaths caused you know, exclusively by a firearm, Th these deaths were entirely preventable if we'd have had an adequate law enforcement response. But those people sat there and reutilized the hand sanitizer as children were being slaughtered. And, and it's heartbreaking to all of us. And we warned the country, we said, look, they're coming for your guns with these active shooter alert bills and red flag bills. And they said, no, 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 we're not coming for your guns. We just want reasonable regulations. And now, we get proven right. They are coming for your guns. They're listing them out in this extensive legislation to try to show people precisely what they ought to be afraid of. And there's nothing to fear from Americans who are, who are lawfully and responsibly using firearms. And so I would suggest that we reject this and that we see these challenges as they come to us, as a the slow creep yield. against the Mr. Second. Gates, will you yield? I'll yield. yield to the gentleman from Texas. Yeah, I would like to point out that to, to the gentleman's point about South Texas and the, the response to the chairman about, oh, well, you know, is the United States military not doing its job to secure the border of the United States? No. The, 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 the entire infrastructure of the federal government is failing to secure the border of the United States in wide, plain, open view. 
all for the entire country to see on a daily basis. 107,000 dead Americans from opioid poisonings and overdoses. Thousands of fentanyl pills pouring into our communities. Gunfire in communities in South Texas as a result of dangerous and violent incursions across the border. The extent to which the cartels are increasingly armed and increasingly dangerous is being reported over and over and over again by those that follow what's happening in the border. And this president, and this Secretary of Homeland Security literally refuse to actually enforce the laws of the United States, allowing a flood into the country, releasing people to the United States while our borders are open with 850,000 known gotaways. They finally issue a report after eight months, I sent a letter to say that 42 individuals affiliated with terrorist countries, terrorist entities had entered the United States, been apprehended. Now we know that number is 56 because they're finally reporting it. And they're doing nothing about it. Absolutely nothing about it. I'd yield back to the gentleman. Well, and, and, and I would also note that the cartels are on both sides of the border. When you go down there, as Mr. Biggs and Mr. Roy do quite frequently, you see that, th that this violence does not simply occur on the Mexican side. And so that's why the amendment is particularly poignant. And I've actually talked with farmers and ranchers on the border who say that they are they are less likely at times to encounter the most dangerous elements of the cartels because the cartels know which ho homes are armed and where people actually go out and, and engage the in shooting practice. Yield? I'll yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Well, and, and uh, the amendment's a great amendment. I appreciate the gentleman uh, for, for yielding. But it's not that they're not capable of doing it. It's done intentionally. Yeah. Of course, they, that's all the more reason for the amendment. When the federal government is intentionally saying, we are not going to have a border, and all you have to do is look at the numbers. All you have to do is remember what the, 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 head, the Secretary of Homeland Security said when he sat right there and we asked him, what about the 42 individuals on the terrorist watch list? What's their status? And his answer was, I don't know. That's why this amendment is so darn important. I yield the back gentleman to you. Now yield. I'll yield. I want to make two points very quickly. Uh, number one, no one's coming for anyone's guns because under the terms of the bill, if you own a prohibited gun, uh, it's grandfathered, you're permitted to keep it. So no one's coming for anyone's guns. And the, secondly, uh, I can only imagine the chaos. Uh, if people have uh, these, these mass uh, weapons, uh, who are they going to shoot? Anybody they suspect? Well, anybody anybody that would hurt they suspect? Them. Anybody they suspect? It'll anybody they would hurt them. Just like in Florida when, when we use our stand our ground laws. That's when you would use them. The gentleman's time has now expired. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Adler, for holding this critical markup, and to Representative Cicilline uh, for your life-saving bill. I'm going to show a video. Uh, before I show the video, I do want to say the following. I previously served on active duty in the United States military. I have two marksmanship ribbons. Not all guns are the same. AR-15s are weapons of war. Not only are the rounds that they fire far more lethal to the human body, they can also fire those rounds much faster. I'm now going to show you a 60 minutes investigation into AR-15s. Could you play the video, please? <laughs> 